Welcome back to Harbour Boxed. Because you know, both got the same thing on. Yep. Uh, anyway, we're here for the monthly Q&A. It's actually the last one of the year, December. Last one of the year. Q&A. Now, we are filming this before Christmas, so I hope you had a Merry Christmas and yep. good time with family and all that, because, yeah, this will be going out after Christmas, obviously, uh, because you'll know that now because you're watching it. Uh, and, yeah, just wrapping up the year, I don't know, it's sort of just this casual thing that we're, <laughs> we'll get it done. We, we're trying to get it all in before all the Christmas stuff. I have family things for the next few days and that. So saw Tim on the last day before the mad Christmas stuff. And we're here for part one of the Q&A. Then we'll have a part two. And I think rather than a part three, we've got something maybe else planned, but we'll, we'll get to that anyway. Yep. You guys will, if that's not live yet, watch this, wait for the next day, part two, and then something else. Sounds good. So yeah, but actually before we do any of that though, Today's video sponsor is Thermal Grizzly and their Cryonaut Extreme, which is now available in a 2 gram syringe. This high performance thermal paste delivers maximum thermal conductivity thanks to an extremely small particle size and layer thickness. It's also very flexible, capable of standing up to sub-zero temperatures for extreme overclocking, but also performs exceptionally well for air and water cooling applications. So if your CPU or GPU needs repasting, then I suggest checking out the Thermal Grizzly range. Link is in the video description. All right, what do we got here, Tim? Do you think Intel, do you think Intel, <laughs> will have enough stock for high-end ARC release in Q2 for wide availability at MSRP? So next year, do you think Intel will have enough of their new uh, high-end GPUs? So I think, because I'm going to, obviously, naturally, I'll pass this off to Tim. Oh, I'm just going to slide this sucker in. Is there our, we go. Very our, nice. It's going to warm up. Do your thing, Tim. Yeah, so let's figure out, will Intel have enough GPU availability to MSRP? That's what I've got to ask. MSRP, that. yep. Okay. Oh, oh, I've got it. I'll move out of the way. It's worked. I've got the answer. It's come to me from the crystal ball. And <sighs> the answer is... I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, that's a safe bet for sure. So obviously, if we put the current situation aside, if this was more well, normal times, as we say, from three, four years ago, they would all sell out straight away. So if it's, if it's a good value product, performance is great, all that sort of stuff, obviously, uh, those things go together, then it would sell out straight away because that's just what happens with GPU releases. If a GPU is even half good, it sells out straight away because there's lots of people in the world and they can only make so many and ship them in so many different directions and they just get snapped up. So during normal times, the first two weeks, it'd basically be impossible to buy one and then supply would improve after that. So that would be the case. Obviously right now that's just com compounded I don't know. I don't even know what number to put on it, basically. But right now, the situation, the demand is crazy because miners aside for a moment. You've just got that many gamers who are looking for a decent value. Like, we're talking MSRP card here. So they'll just be... Demand would be sky high. I don't know how many times more than what we would normally see. But even if they had, what would you say, like three, four times than what we would normally see, it would still be months without being able to buy one, I would have thought. Yeah, I think the issues with this product is kind of how long ago did Intel book their TSMC capacity to make this product? Because if it was before the supply constraints really started kicking in, then there would have been, you know, planning for a normal market where sort of what you're saying, where, you know, GPU availability would be bad for a couple of weeks and mm. then sort of come into being more available and that would be based on you know how much intel thinks they're going to sell of a new gpu i think you know they're not going to be hitting nvidia numbers straight off the bat so you would <laughs> think that intel probably wasn't planning to be making that sort of volume of gpus to begin with whereas nowadays they probably could get away with making nvidia level volumes oh, yeah. because they'd be selling out so i think there's a lot of question marks there about you know when did they book that supply, uh, how much they have, which is going to dictate is it going to be possible to buy these products at the MSRP yep. and have good availability. So I think... Yeah. So that, that's trying to accurately guess. Yeah. But I think, it, as you say, the safe bet is no matter what the situation yeah. is, no is the answer. No, and I think it's like an kind of like an extra no, like yeah. very much no. Absolutely in, in no. The, in the current climate. Um, so. 
like you say, if they if they do have products that perform well at the MSRP, they'll be sought after more than any other product because you can't buy them at the MSRP. Obviously, the good news is, and while we're sort of laughing at how ridiculous the situation is now, which some of you may not be appreciating, the good news is, though, that there will be more graphics cards. So yeah. they will be helping to solve the current problem. So at the very yeah. least, that's a takeaway, a positive yeah. takeaway. And I think it's a great time for Intel as well because in a normal market, what we're sort of talking about is people may not be willing to jump on a new GPU mm -hmm. vendor because of you know dr concerns around drivers and game compatibility and support. So you'd think most people, you know, AMD already finds it hard enough to sell their GPUs up against NVIDIA. This, mm. you know, you're going to see similar issues with Intel normally, but in this current climate, I think people are going to be willing to look past a lot of those concerns. Yes. If performance and value is good and supply is reasonable, they will be able to rapidly expand their install base, which then yeah. will help with the development of the product. And it may end up being that it's a situation where it's like beneficial in years to come, where yeah. they really hit the ground running and they become established and then there's three main players. Yeah, you really it really is the best time for them. It's mm -hmm. kind of like they're hitting the hot market while it's hot mm -hmm. and getting their food in the door in the best possible way. So we'll see what all that happens next year. But yeah, stock and availability, unfortunately, yeah, I don't mm. think it's looking great. Don't need a crystal ball for that one. All right, I think this one's for you, Tim, because again, I see monitor in there. So nice. we'll, we'll, we'll have a look at this one. So given how terrible monitor naming schemes almost universally are, what would your name scheme for a range of monitors look like? I reckon you'd go with something like a, an alphabetical sort of letter, letter from the alphabet, and then sort of a numerical value like C1 would be mm. something you'd go for. Yeah, I think we were joking about this on the live stream that we did earlier today, yeah. but um, monitor names, yeah, the issue is you want to make it so that if you've got a good monitor, you can recommend it easily to your friends. So, so something that's them, memorable yeah. that you can say, like the current monitor names where it's like four letters, three numbers, you can't really remember what it is. Yep. So, you know, unless you're really in the market and you're sort of very, very familiar with all that. So I kind of like... Sorry, I was going to say, most people aren't. Most people they do aren't. a bit. They do a heap of research. They buy a monitor. It's great that they may forget the exact name or whatever. Yeah. And then some of them also have similar names and there's variations, yeah, exactly. which makes it confusing. So which one do you have? Which one are you recommending? And because we were talking about my new MSI monitor yeah. and I, I th you got the name right. I, don't, I have no idea. <laughs> I, I've not I've not even bothered to look at it. I'm like, cool, Tim yeah. recommended that one. It's an MSI 4K 144Hz 32 inch monitor. That's yeah. all I need to know. Yeah, exactly. So I think the best the best way that I have seen monitor manufacturers do it tends to be almost like the Samsung way of doing it, where you've got like a memorable product family name that isn't mm. MSI, I think, with your monitor, but with like MPG. That's not very memorable. But Samsung mm. uses Odyssey, which is a word. Like mm. it's a, a memorable word and then a couple of numbers and letters that are going to signify the exact product. So like Odyssey G7, I know there's a couple of different Odyssey G7s, but something along those lines, would, yeah. I think make the most sense. So it should be the, the name of the company, so Samsung, then a nice memorable product series. So if it's like your gaming series, you might have a name. If it's your office series, you might have a name. If it's mm -hmm. like high-end HDR, you might have a different name. And then just like, I think maybe three letters or four letters would be the absolute maximum. Just like the, the size of it, like Odyssey yeah. G5, 27 inch or 32 yeah, inch. exactly. I don't even care so much, like, it's borderline, I guess, sort of misleading, but I don't even care so much if the 27-inch monitor, for example, isn't that good, and the 32-inch is the really good one. I know they're under the same family branding, yeah. but there is that distinction there of the size. Yeah. Whereas we wouldn't really like that if they did that with graphics cards, but being that monitor naming yeah. is so bad and there are so many monitors, I think that would be acceptable. It'd certainly yeah. be better than yeah. what we currently have. I think, yeah, the only time you wouldn't want to have to mon you wouldn't want to have two monitors with the same name that are the same panel size like that would be yep. bad like if they're using different panels or sure. whatever yep. but i think most brands could very easily switch to using this sort of product name like there are so many just mm. random words that you could include that would make it so much easier for people to rec remember and then mm. recommend and yeah the the way where we see msi using like nine letters and numbers mm -hmm. it's even worse than some of the CPU yeah, names. Yeah, I guess they're like they're like barcodes, they're serial numbers. They're not yeah. product names, they're serial numbers. It's like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they're marketing serial numbers. So will that ever happen? Probably not, nah. but ideally that's what we'd like to see. All right, Steve. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that Intel doesn't have hyperthreading on the e-cores for 12th gen? 
Wouldn't that improve efficiency slash power for multi-core workloads, which is what the e-cores are there for? I think it's a pretty good question. So I think hyper-threading would improve efficiency of a core. I think the problem is space. So the idea is they want to get four e-cores in the space of a single p-core. Yep. And that's that to me seems like the primary constraint there. Yes. That's what they wanted to achieve. And by adding a hyper-threading type technology, they wouldn't have fit in that space. I I don't actually know how much extra die space a hyper-threading or an SMT technology re is uh, requires for that architecture, but it's something, right? Yeah, adding features to a CPU costs die yeah. space. So it's like the weakness of the e-cores seen in gaming is a result of the core-to-core -core communication. So the interconnect there for the e-cores isn't what you see with the p-cores. The p-cores are bigger and fatter because of multiple reasons, and one of them being that they can communicate. There's there's more bandwidth between the cores there, which they've just stripped out of the e-cores because the e-cores aren't focused on gaming. You know, for, for gaming, it's the background tasks that it's been marketed as, which is fair enough, I guess. Where the real benefit is it allows uh, Intel to crack this productivity problem they've had with their lower core count parts competing with stuff like Zen 3. And a lot of those workloads don't need a lot of core-to-core -core communication. So those stripped out e-cores work really well for big Cinebench scores, for example, and you know, they're pretty good in a lot of rendering applications. So I think that's the main reason why they haven't got hyper-threading in there is because they've taken a core, you know, their, their Skylake type core and they've stripped it down to the point where you know it'll fit in, as I said, four of them will fit in the space of a P-Core. So what compromises had to be made along the way to make it fit in that size? Yeah, I imagine that their design team would have gone down a process of figuring out what sort of performance benefit we would get from adding hyper-threading mm -hmm. versus the die cost mm -hmm. for adding that. And it, it may have come out to a point where adding hyper-threading, maybe that cluster of E cores would only have been three cores with hyper-threading, mm -hmm. and maybe it turns out that the four cores without hyper-threading outperforms the three cores with hyper-threading. Mm -hmm. So those are the sort of design decisions that the teams would be making around that. But and Because of other things they've stripped out of the cores, yeah. it's quite likely that adding hyper-threading wouldn't give nearly the boost it does of yes. a fully fledged core. Yeah, exactly. So then the efficiency of hyperthreading in that scenario actually isn't there, as Tim basically yeah, saying. Yeah, part of the idea of hyperthreading is utilizing parts of the CPU that aren't being utilized by one thread. Because CPUs have lots of different parallel parts that it can all be yeah. used. So, so ideally, with hyperthreading, you're trying to feed all those bits. But e-cores being so small, they don't necessarily have as many of those. Yeah parallel pipelines to mm -hmm. be used, like a P-Core might have. Mm -hmm. So like you say, the Hyper 3 may not benefit them too much. And again, I think we've seen with this design that it's so optimized that they have, it's not like they're deliberately leading it, leaving it out for, you know, because they're being silly. You yeah, know, they've yeah, made yeah. the decision because it uh, makes sense. They wanted to make, they really needed to make this as powerful as possible and as efficient as possible to compete with Zen 3, especially on the productivity front. It's like they've left out hyper-threading to add it in for the next generation. They, yeah, and the rumors are saying that they're not getting hyper-threading yeah, equals. But they wouldn't be doing that. They're not in a position where they can deliberately do that. Yeah, um, exactly. Okay, what percentage increase in a single thread performance in a single generation would you consider poor, average, and excellent, respectively? So... I would say that poor would be like 5% or less, yep. which is what we saw from Intel from a long time. So yep. I think it's we've sort of already established that, haven't we? And then uh, average, 10%? Yeah, I think on average, if you're 10, seeing... 10, 15? It, I think there's kind of a couple of different ways to look at it, isn't there? Because... La larger gains, you would think, would be average if the cadence between CPUs was longer. Like, if you mm -hmm. were waiting a year versus three years, for three year, a three-year wait, you'd be expecting a much larger gain on average. Yes. So I think if you're sort of looking at the current cadence that we've got, where it's like 18 months to a year, sort mm -hmm. of 12 to 18 months, mm -hmm. then 10% would be around the mark for average, I would say. Yeah. And then good would be... You know, around that sort of fifteen and yeah, twenty percent. I think twenty percent is a, a very good yeah. um, performance uplift, yeah. and yeah. that's sort of what we've seen from say like a, it's firmly in the good camp. Yeah, exactly. So, I think Alder Lake was what like a nearly a twenty percent. Of course, it depends on how you go about measuring yeah. it, but yeah, roughly thereabouts. Which... Yeah, so I think that's that is definitely in the very good mm -hmm. sort of level. So mm -hmm. yeah, five, ten, fifteen, twenty. Yep, I think that makes sense. 
All right, would you welcome a potential mainstream CPU shift to ARM-based architectures if the performance did not suffer, even if it meant more integrated solutions like the M1 and less scope for PC building? I don't like <laughs> I don't like that part. I don't the way this question is phrased, it, it doesn't make much sense to switch to ARM. Like if the performance isn't suffering, so in other words the performance is the same, then what would be the advantage of leaving x86 for ARM? There'd be no yeah, advantage. Only disadvantages. And if the disadvantage is the things like it being more integrated, less scope for PC building, then you definitely wouldn't want that. Mm. But the advantage that you want to see from ARM are things like increased performance, increased efficiency, ideally both of those things. And then the compromises that are made to achieve that are things like you know, having to shift architectures, so you have to recode all your applications. And then, of course, the integrated solutions side of things that you're talking about here. So yeah, I think if we're going to see ARM come across to like desktop PCs and PC PCs that normally would be built, um, it would need to offer like a substantial performance uplift. I think the efficiency mm. side of things doesn't really excite I'm, desktop yeah, PCs too much because it's like... Again, I'm not people, saying we don't care about efficiency. Yeah, but it's like people already buy 350-watt GPUs that are yeah. only like a fraction of a percent faster than much more efficient cards. So... Mm. Yeah, the switch to ARM for desktop to me would have to be because it offers a significant performance improvement. Yeah. And I think that is a pretty tall order at the moment. We're certainly not at the level where that would be possible. All right. Why do you keep resizable bar disabled for benchmarks but enable XMP, so extreme memory profile? Both options are off by default. Hot topic. Lots right. of people want to know, Steve. Sorry. Explain yourself. Well, first of all, we're not married to the idea of not using resizable bar. It's something we may change next year. Uh, we'll reevaluate. We'll look into it. And yeah, it may be something we change. Why haven't we done it to date? Let's start with that. So first of all, the comparison with XMP, while I get it, it's kind of apples to oranges and doesn't make too much sense. So XMP has been... Uh, sort of a feature of motherboards for a long time now. Intel introduced it, I don't even know what year, we could probably Google yes. it quickly. It's a long, 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 yeah. long time ago. So what are the benefits of XMP? It allows novice users and even experienced users to quickly set up their memory to run at what the modules are advertised to, providing they're compatible with the board. It's a one-click auto setup type feature and it allows you to get the maximum performance out of those modules. And what are the there's really no disadvantages to XMP. So providing that the motherboard manufacturer has done a good job and the modules have you know, got a fair bit of wriggle room there, it should just, you should enable it, performance should go up, stability shouldn't be compromised and it should just work. And in my experience, it does. So, and it's a feature that gamers are pretty well educated on. XMP is the thing they know about. You go on the BIOS, you hit the on button. It varies. Generally, it's, like MSI have it right at the top, you hit yep. the profile you want, you save and exit, it's done. And it boosts performance across the board, which I think is a key thing to emphasize here. It does boost performance across the board for all games. Will be, you know, if you put it in your memories running at DDR4 2133 and you have like DDR4 3600, CL 1618, whatever it may be, enabling that profile will give you a massive, massive performance boost, like 20, 30, 40, 50% performance boost in games and applications. So gamers know what it's all about. Um, it's been around for a long time and there's really no drawbacks to it. You enable it, performance goes through the roof and stability shouldn't be compromised because you know, they should have done all the you know, compatibility testing and whatnot. So resizable bar on the other hand, it's a, another feature that you can enable in the BIOS. It's generally a bit harder to find in the BIOS. So first of all, most gamers don't really know what resizable bar is. We did a poll recently, and while the majority of you who had access to resizable bar had enabled it, there were a lot of people who were like, so what's this resizable bar all about? Do I need to know about it? So gamers aren't educated on it. Um, it's harder to find in most BIOSes and enable. Um, it, that has improved with new newer BIOS revisions, but it is a bit harder to find. And then the real big issue for us is the fact that performance is just all over the place. So you'll enable it, Assassin's Creed, uh, Valhalla, uh, Halo Infinite, those games all see nice performance boosts with it enabled, but there are plenty of games that see no performance increase, which is, you know, that's fine. That's not too much of an issue, but there are a lot of games where performance goes backwards and some games even causes 
weird issues, stuttering problems, um, stability related problems. And the other thing that we haven't really looked into at the moment, because testing a feature like resize or bar, you can get like a Radeon GPU. I think we use like the Radeon RX 6800 and we tested like 30 games. And that's where we found some games benefited. Most didn't, some went the other way. But we've got to test a wide range of GPUs. We've got to test a wide range of platforms. There's, I don't want to, like XMP, for example, you get a Haswell-based system, you know, an AMD FX-based system, you know, bulldozer type stuff, um, Ryzen-based, whatever it is, you enable XMP and it gives you a good performance boost. Sure, it's going to vary on those platforms depending on what memory you use, but it boosts, it, you know, it, a, a rising tide, you know, lifts all ships type deal. It boosts performance across the board, no matter what platform you're talking about. Resizable bar, if we use like a, you know, a Ryzen 5000 CPU and we're doing a lot of, say, Radeon 6000 testing, you're going to see, you know, those nice performance boosts in like a Halo Infinite, in like Assassin's Creed Valhalla. But then what happens if we do some testing with NVIDIA GPUs on an Intel platform? And of course, the AMD fans, like, that's why we want you testing resizable bar, because it looks good for AMD with their SAM support. But yeah, it, it can get a bit tricky. So basically, what we want to do an updated evaluation of all of the platforms, the various different GPUs, you know, Radeon 5000 series and Ampere and Turing and all that stuff. And... I guess early next year we'll aim to do that, like maybe late January, depending on what products are released, and we'll work out how we're going to proceed in 2022 with resizable bar. But yeah, I think it makes sense. It's 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 a situation with these benchmarks where if there's a feature where it's known that you can turn on and gain performance in all situations, mm -hmm. then you'd probably recommend people to use it. But mm -hmm. one, when you're in these situations where performance can go up, but it can also go down, and it's unclear where the line is for that like mm -hmm. we, does it benefit more or more games more often or less games more often or whatever the situation is then it doesn't become a situation where we can just easily say yes we're going to turn it on for all benchmarking we do need to evaluate it and mm -hmm. certainly the previous evaluation that you did on the feature came to the conclusion that the performance uplift on average was small and some yeah. and some games did benefit well were negatively affected. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's not like we're just sitting here saying, oh, you know, we're never going to use resizable bar because it's not enabled by default or whatever the reason that some people use is. It's like yeah. it, choosing settings to use while benchmarking is more complicated than that. And mm -hmm. it's why we spend a lot of time on configuring systems to mostly use features that we believe most people will enable or have enabled, which tends to be the default features. And if there's anything that affects performance, then that requires pretty in-depth investigations to make sure that we're being fair and that the feature does benefit people most of the time, so mm -hmm. you can recommend it. So yeah, I'm sure there's lots of people out there who have enabled resizable bar and are like, this works great for me. You know, this is awesome. All I play is Halo Infinite. I saw a big performance boost here. I'm very happy to have my Radeon GPU because of that. But again, we test so many different configurations mm -hmm. that, yeah, it's just not as simple as being able to say that we're going to enable it. Yeah. And again, as you sort of said, there's not, I know a lot of people have a go at us and say, oh, you know, XMP is not enabled by default either. It's like, that's a reason. And yep. we were pretty clear in the, the last you know, resizable bar related content piece that we did. There are a few different reasons for why we haven't just enabled it for all of our testing yet, which is something we may do next year. We don't know. As I said, we'll reevaluate. But there are a few different reasons for why we haven't done that yet. Yeah, and there's all sorts of features where you can turn them on and potentially get performance gains like you know, the hardware GPU scheduling feature that you see mm. in Windows that's not enabled by default. You can mm. see performance gains some of the time using it, but Again, when you're sort of moving away from a default setting, you have to really consider why you're making that choice. And mm -hmm. there's been, you know, there's also that, um, what is it, the virtualized security feature that you can see in Windows 11. Mm -hmm. That's another feature where, you know, you have to make a really considered decision about should that be enabled while testing it. Again, it's not as simple as just using it, mm -hmm. or just, you know, you have to really justify your decision. So again, I think a, a, an updated investigation will, give us a good idea on that coming next year. And yeah, like we sort of said, the testing that we've done already has been based on our previous investigation. So yeah, sometimes we need to update those. 
You have sometimes mentioned in your monitor reviews that they have fake HDR capabilities, but what about the content itself? I recently got a new TV and started to update my movie collection to 4K. While doing research, I discovered that some movies reach barely above 200 nits, despite being marketed as having HDR, therefore being more like SDR within HDR container. Apparently, this fake HDR goes to games as well. How common is this exactly, and are there even more than a few true HDR games or movies available? So, I think this sort of question is best tackled by channels that look more into content than us, so mm -hmm. I'm sure you'll get a more in-depth uh, answer from someone like HDTV Test, who does great work and will go into and look at movies and tell you whether it's real or you know, fake HDR. Based on my experience just anecdotally using HDR, mostly for movies, I haven't played a lot of HDR games, is that most movies, I'd say, do not have fake HDR. Obviously, there are some examples. I think the Star Wars remasters on Blu-ray are a notable example there where the brightness doesn't get too high. But on top of that, I think when we're talking about HDR, people get very caught up in the benefits to brightness. But brightness is only one element of HDR, and you can still get benefits from it being an HDR movie, even if the brightness isn't very high, because ultimately it's on the movie maker to decide the sort of style that they want to use in their HDR video. And if you're not filming scenes that are particularly bright, it may not make sense to use high levels of brightness. But HDR also, you get benefits from the higher bit depth. So most HDR content is mastered at 10 or even 12 bits compared to 8 bit for SDR. And then on top of that, the way the data is distributed with HDR is more heavily weighted to dark scenes. So even if you're not getting high levels of brightness from your HDR content, you may be getting more detail in dark scenes because the gamma curve is different and yeah, just simply more data is allocated to shadow content. So even though you might think that this low brightness HDR video is exactly the same as SDR in the same container, they may actually look different if you view them side by side because of the differences in detail in those dark regions. And then on top of that, you also have differences in color spaces, like HDR can go generally much wider in terms of its color gamut, which again, maybe you're just in it for the brightness, but having more vivid colors can be a benefit of HDR as well. So I think there's a few different things to consider there when it comes to assessing something as being fake HDR or not. There's certainly many elements to HDR that make something HDR that's not just brightness. Ideally, you know, people mastering content would use all the different benefits available to them. And there are definitely some situations like those Star Wars remasters where they haven't, you know, it's a Star Wars game. There's laser swords, right? <laughs> like that should be a really bright element. Maybe they could have done a better job there. But based on my experience, I don't think fake HDR as we move into the HDR era is happening as often as this question makes out. Okay, what would you consider the ultimate size in inches for a monitor for gaming and productivity sitting on a reasonable or sitting at a reasonable distance on a desk? Uh, assuming you would use two monitors, so 27 inch or 32 inch, 43 inch seems way too big, definitely for dual monitors. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, you need to sit too far away from it. Okay, well, for me, yeah, 32 inch is the the sweet spot for me. I've got two 32 inch 4K, 144 hertz panels at the moment. It's the MSI MPG, yada, yada, yada. Um, so that's a great monitor. Recommend it. Uh, yeah, 32 inch is good. For dual monitors, 43 would be a bit ridiculous. Um, and 27, I find too small. Yeah, I think that's fairly reasonable. Obviously, it depends a lot on your, again, it always depends, doesn't it? Depends on your desk setup, how you know how massive your desk is, so how close you can sit, your eyesight. There's many different considerations there. I think, you know, I personally use more 27-inch class monitors, but that's mostly because I use ultra-wides. Ultra-wides, you tend not to get the sort of larger 32-inch class, mm -hmm. you know, height-wise very often. So, for me, I think a size between 30 and 40 inches would be ideal. Um, obviously, the lower end of that if you're using dual monitors, so that would be 32-inch. Mm -hmm. But if you had a single monitor, especially for gaming, I think up to sort of that 40-inch range could still be very usable. That would be very immersive, sort mm. of give you that big field of view experience. But anything above that, you know, I think, you know, a lot of talk about those new OLEDs coming out at 42 inches. I think that's very much the maximum that I could see myself using at a desk. Yeah. I've used the 48-inch TVs as a monitor. I think it's too big. And then 24-inch, I think, is too small. Mm -hmm. So, 
yeah, I think yeah, 30 to 40 inches is probably the sweet spot. So I think your choice of 32 inches is very justified there. Okay, that is going to do it for part one of the final Q&A of 2021. We've, we've got to December and we're getting the year right, which bodes well for next year. I can't wait for 2022 when you say 2021 every time. Yeah, it'll take me at least six months to get it right, I reckon. Yeah, yeah, but, you yeah. know, that's pretty typical. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, but other than that, I mean, I'd like to say it's been a good year, but not a great year for tech and not a great year in general. But it is over, and we're hoping next year will be better. But, hey, the Q&A series has been a lot of fun this year. Yeah, I've enjoyed so. catching up with you while mm-hmm. possible. Obviously, yes. there's been a few episodes throughout the year where that Th- hasn't been Probably so more than half. Probably most of them. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, I think, you know, I'm keeping positive about next year. I think there should be some good stuff happening. So You've got to. Uh, let's, let's hope that, um, yeah, we can continue catching up in person for the foreseeable future. And That'd be nice. What else is there? I guess 20% club for people at this point. So thank you for watching to the end of these longer videos. And we've also got stuff like Patreon. We and do have stuff like, Yes, we do. If you're interested in signing up, we just did the live stream mm-hmm. today. So people got a bit of pre-Christmas entertainment from us. And then, yeah, we'll be doing another live stream next month as well. So obviously, great time to sign up and get access to all that stuff. Discord community, mm-hmm. all that wonderful stuff. And yeah. That pretty much does it, I guess. Yep. So I'm your host, Steve. I'm your host, Tim. See you next time.